of your copy of scripture. We're going to be in 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3 as we close out our series on unshakable hope. One of the things it seems that um, our world is preoccupied with is the end of the world. Um, we see movies, we see books, everything is, you know, what would happen if the world actually ended? In fact, there's a, a thought exercise that people use. Um, they'll say something like this. Um, if you knew that the world was going to end tomorrow, what would you do? And inevitably, what we do is we talk about places we want to go, people we want to see, how we would spend the last little bit of our money. And after doing that for about 10 minutes, we just forget all about it. It, it doesn't change us at all. Well, today, what you're going to find out is that the Bible tells you it is a literal fact that the world is going to end. This is not going to be here forever. And because of that, it doesn't say, what are you going to do or where are you going to go? Here's what it says. Because the world is going to end, what kind of person should you be? What kind of person should you be? How do you live in light of that? One of the things that we have to really look at and we've been talking about is hope. And what Peter is trying to focus us on is this is that real living hope only comes when we are connected to Jesus. When we love him and we serve him and we follow him. What kind of people should we be? And so as we look at this today, I really want you to think about this. Because I think for many of us as Christians, we kind of live with the attitude of we're never gonna die. We've got plenty of time, that this is not my responsibility. There aren't people literally dying and going to hell. And so we don't have to think about it or worry about it because the end is so far away. This may surprise you. That's exactly how the people that Peter wrote to felt too. This isn't something we need to think about. This doesn't need to impact the way that we live. Here's what he says. The world is going to end. What kind of person should you be? So let's look at 2 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 1. This is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you, in which I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken to you by your pro, uh, the apostles. Know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you. And as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, 
and which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort as they do the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you're not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Christ, or Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and the day to the day of eternity. Amen. Peter is concerned about his people. This is the second book that he's written to them. And he's told us multiple times that I've written these things to remind you so that you can hang on and deal with what's going on in the world. And so you can make it to the end. And he says it again, it's, I'm writing to you again to remind you. But, but this time what he's trying to do is to anchor them into something that's gonna change their life. And so here's what he, here's what he says. I wanna stir up your sincerity. And what he means by that is he, he says, I want you to be focused. I want you to be single-minded. I want you to have one purpose in your life. Because in Peter's day, like in our day, they have information overload. There are voices in their lives and in our lives that try to drown out God's voice in our life. You ever feel that way? The, the difficult thing that we need to recognize is that we have voices that are trying to disciple us to follow them and not follow Jesus. And here's what he says. I wanna stir up this idea that you need to be focused. You need to be single-minded. You need to be sincere. And here, here's the thing, here's the problem with that. Focus, sincerity, Single-minded is, is not something you fall into. You have to be intentional about it. You have to want it. You have to pursue it. And here's what he says. Listen, it's not enough. It's not enough to hear the word. You have to apply the word. And so he says, listen, there, there, there's this wave of voices that is seeking to drown you and is seeking to drown out God's work in your life. And so I want to just stop for just a second and say, listen, Focus up. As we used to say in school, put your listening ears on. Be single-minded about what you listen to. And he says, listen, I'm gonna tell you what you need to listen to and who you need to listen to. He says, anchor yourself in God's word. That you should remember, look at verse two, that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. The reality is this, when we anchor ourselves in God's word, it drowns out all the other voices. When was the last time that you heard the still small voice of God? When was the last time? When was the last time that you heard God speak to you in a tangible way? Because he is speaking. And for many of us, the reason that we can't hear God's voice is we have all these other people that are speaking in our head and our heart and they're drowning it out. So he says, listen, I wanna, I wanna tell you, you need to focus up, pay attention be single-minded that the only thing that, that, that adapts and, and grows your opinion or, or helps you to live your life is God's word and nothing else and no one else. Now, there's a word that he uses in here multiple times that I'm thankful for. He uses it in verse one. He uses it several other times and it's the word beloved. Peter is trying to communicate something to his people and I wanna communicate the same thing. He, he says, this is to people that I love. Not church members, not congregants, not attendees, not numbers, people that I know and I love. And not only people that I know and love, but people that God knows and loves. I want you to take a moment and, and let that sink in. You are loved by God. You are known 
by God. And God wants to have a deep, intimate, personal relationship with you. And that only happens when we are singularly focused. We have one purpose in our heart and mind, and that's to know him, that's to love him, and that's to serve him. One of the difficult things that Peter is dealing with in his day that we deal with in our day, because there's this information overload, because there's this overwhelming sense of there's so many things to do and so many things we need to talk about and so many things we need to believe that that here's the thing, it gives us permission to not be on mission. It gives us permission not to be on mission because there's so many other things I gotta think about. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta work on my career. I gotta make sure my career's where it needs to be. I gotta build my 401k. I gotta get a bigger house. I gotta go on better trips. I gotta get better clothes. Because that's what we're being told. And here's what he says, no, you have been given one mission and one mission only. That is to come into faith with Jesus Christ and then to share the gospel and live the gospel. One mission. Now I'm thankful that he follows this up with a a great piece of advice and some ways to work this out. Here's a piece of advice that he gives us. He says, know this, know this. People will think you are crazy for living this way. Understand this. Understand, if you settle yourself on loving and serving Jesus, if you settle yourself on saying, I'm not gonna listen to anyone or anything that doesn't line up with the scripture, if you say, I'm only gonna live out what God wants me to do, people are gonna think you're crazy. And unfortunately, sometimes the people who think you're the craziest are not the lost. It's those in the church. Peter did not write this to a group of people who were lost. Peter wrote it to church people. Guys, I need you to focus up. I need you to pay attention. I need you to to settle on the word and, and let the word do what the word wants to do in your life and understand if you truly try to live the way that Jesus wants you to live and you truly try to apply it in your life, people are gonna think you're crazy. but that's okay. Because here's what he says. They mock what you hold most dear. Verse three, know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. They make fun of you and they say, listen, there's no reason you should be living this way. Nothing has ever changed. This isn't getting the job done. Peter wants us to understand that there have always been and will always be people who make fun of what we hold most dear. Now, everybody wants to know when the last days are. And so let me tell you when the last days are. The last days began the day that Jesus died and they will complete when Jesus splits the sky and he comes back in judgment and in power and in glory. That's the last days. But here's what he says. They mock what you hold dear. They make fun of you for holding on to the word. They make fun of you for standing on what Jesus wants you to do. They make fun of you for applying the scripture in your life. And here's the thing, here's what he's trying to say. Don't be surprised and don't be hurt because it says more about them than it does about you. Well, what does it say about them? Well, it says that they don't truly believe that God exists. Their first thing is, well, where is God? Where is God? He's been promising that he's gonna come back and he hadn't come back. So nothing's changed. And here, and listen to what they say. Nothing has changed since creation. Hmm. Did we forget that Jesus came and that Jesus lived on the earth for 33 and a half years and did amazing and wonderful miracles? He died on the cross to pay for our sin and he went into the grave and he conquered sin, death, hell, and the devil. And he rose again under his own power, but giving us salvation. But yeah, nothing's changed. 
Here's what they're saying. God isn't there. Because God isn't doing what they want him to do when, he, when they want him to do it. So God isn't there. There's nothing to worry about. There's nothing to be forgiven of. We just need to figure out how to do our own thing in our own way because God isn't really there. Well, how do they get to that place? Well, he tells us. In verse three, they're following after their own lusts. They're preoccupied with themselves. Peter is trying to remind us as believers, one of the dangerous things that can happen to us is that we become so preoccupied with ourselves and what we want and how we want it, we can totally miss God. In fact, he's gonna say that in just a second. They are so preoccupied with what they want and how they want it and when they want it, nothing else matters. Not even what God has said and how Christ has spoken and what Christ has done. Because they are preoccupied with themselves, they totally and completely miss God. Again, Peter is writing this to Christians because he understands that there are voices and there are, there are voices and there are forces and there's pressure in our life that's pushing us for different things and pushing us in different ways and, and trying to put pressure on us to, you know, to, to cave and do all these different things. And here's what he's saying. Have you anchored yourself in God's word? Because if you haven't, if you haven't, you can become so preoccupied with what's going on in your life that you miss God. And so here's a question. Are you missing God in your life? Are you missing him? Because here's what they say. God isn't here. God isn't speaking. God isn't doing anything. In fact, he hasn't done anything since creation. Look at verse five. Peter says, when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water and through which the world at that time was destroyed being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Here's what he's saying. They miss everything that God is doing. And look, I understand It is easy to miss God when your life's a mess. It's easy to miss God when you're struggling with sin. It's easy to miss God when there's trials or there's troubles or things aren't going your way. It's easy to miss God because why? We become preoccupied with ourself. And here's the danger. When we miss God, we miss the only thing that can save us and give us hope. He talks about these people because they miss God all around them. It's funny that they talk about creation, but they forget that it doesn't take but a walk outside to remind yourself that God is here. It always blows me away when people say that there's no evidence of God. And I'm like, have you ever walked outside? Have you ever looked up at the sky? Have you ever, you know, marveled at the stars? Have you ever stood on the side of the Grand Canyon and looked at that and say, this can't have come by itself? Waterfalls and and, and oceans and the wonderful things of the world and the, the expanse of the universe, we can look and see that there is a God. But here's the problem. When we're so preoccupied with ourselves, we don't see God anywhere because here's how we look for him. Are you ready? God, I can't see you. God, I don't see you at work. God, I I don't see you anywhere. Well, because you've chosen not to look for him. 
And not only do they not see him, but they don't know that he's speaking to them. God has clearly spoken all throughout the history. He just said it in verse one, from the prophets to Jesus, to the apostles, to God's word, God has clearly spoken to us. And here's something you need to hear today. God is clearly speaking to you right now. And he has been speaking to you every moment of every day. And you say, well, I don't hear him. Well, when you become preoccupied with yourself and preoccupied with what you want, here's how you listen to God. Okay, God, speak. God, I only wanna hear the things that make me feel good. I only wanna hear the things that agree with what I already believe. God, I, I don't wanna be challenged. God, I, I don't wanna hear anything that would make me try to love somebody differently or, or change the way that I think or change the things that I do. God, you just speak the things that I already agree with and then I'll hear you. It doesn't work that way. God is speaking. And here's the most important thing. They miss out on God's work. Peter reaches back into the Old Testament. He talks about creation. He talks about the flood and he connects them to the end of the world. And here's what he's saying. God has, God is, and God always will be at work in our lives. Whether we see it, whether we feel it, whether we understand it, God has, God is, and God always will be at work. And we can trust that. So here's what he says to us. Don't let this escape your attention. Don't be, don't be like those people who are completely preoccupied with themselves where they miss God and they don't hear from God and they don't, you know, don't see God working in their life. Don't be like them. Don't let this escape your attention. Now, here's what he says. Look at verse eight. Do not let this one fact escape your attention. And then he gives us a bunch of facts. It's not one fact, it's a bunch of facts. But, but here's what he's saying. Fundamentally, here's what I want you to see that's gonna change the way that you live. Don't let this one fact escape your notice. Beloved, there's that word again. That with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness. His pay is patient toward you, not wishing for anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up since all these things are to be destroyed in this way. What sort of people ought you to be? He says, don't let this escape your attention. God's timing is not our timing. Now, I know that you can read verses eight and nine in a certain way that they come out sounding more like a curse than a promise. That a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. And I know that can sound bad, but here's what he's saying is that sometimes when we're in the midst of trials, they can seem much longer than they really are. They seem all consuming. It's like, that's all I've ever experienced. That's all I ever know. And then the, the problem is, then you get into something good and something good happens and it lasts for 37 and a half seconds. But the point is this, God is not slow about his promise. God's timing and our timing are very different. Um, here's the thing, our timing is this, I want it now. And God's timing is perfect. God has never been slow. God has never been late. God's never been too early. He's always right on time. One of the wonderful things that we hear in the New Testament is this, that in the fullness of time, at the right time, God sent Jesus. So here's the point that he's making. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're dealing with, God is not being slow. He's not sitting up in heaven going, you know what? Let me just see how much I can pile onto them. Let me see how much they can take before they crack. Let me do, no, 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 no. What we're, what we're doing is this. 
We have to wait for God in the right time to deliver us because that's what he does. That's who he is. So don't let this escape your notice. God has, God is, and God always will be at work in your life, even if it seems like it's slow, because it's not. Then he says this, here's something else that shouldn't escape our notice. God is patient toward you. Man, I am thankful for that. Aren't you? Aren't you thankful that God is patient toward you? I am because I'm a knucklehead. There are times in my life when I say things about God that are not true because my feelings get hurt. There are times in my life when stuff is going on and it's not happening as fast as I want it to happen. And so I try to put my hands on it, make it work. And it just makes a bigger mess. And in all of that, God doesn't get angry with me. God doesn't get, you know, he doesn't want to shame me. He doesn't want to punish me. God is patient toward me and God is patient toward you. Here's a scary question to think about. What would it be like if God treated us the way that we treat others? What would it be like with a lack of kindness? What would it be like for him to hate us? What would it be like for, for him to completely write us off when we've done something? Or maybe we didn't do something. We just, you just felt like we did something. What would it be like? Aren't we thankful that God is patient toward us? Now, the question is, why is God patient toward us? Why would he do that? Well, he tells us, not wishing for anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Now, this may be a surprise or a shock to some of you, but here's the thing. God does not want you to perish. God does not want to punish you. God doesn't want to, you know, string you up by your toenails because of stuff that you've done. God doesn't want you to perish. He wants to restore the relationship that he wants with you. That's what he wants to do. So God is patient. I think this is one of the things that makes the gospel so different from every other religious text and every other religious idea. God does not want to punish you for your sin. He wants to forgive you and heal you. Now, in the midst of that, we also don't need to let this escape our attention. That the day of the Lord is like the thief, is like a thief in the night. Yes, God is kind. Yes, God is gracious. Yes, God is compassionate. Yes, God is forgiving, but God is also just. And because of that, God will not strive with humanity forever. There will come a day when evil will be punished. There will come a day of judgment. Now, for us as Christians, we, we don't think a lot about the day of the Lord. That was a, a phrase used often in the Old Testament. For us, the day of the Lord, we, we think all about, well, Jesus is coming to get us, yes. But the day of the Lord in the Old Testament is painted as one of the scariest, most horrible days in the history of days. I, I think Amos paints the best picture. Amos talks about the day of the Lord and he talks about a man who was on a journey. And he finished his journey and he wanted to get home. And as he's coming home, he meets a bear in the woods and the bear tries to attack him and he barely gets away with his life. And as soon as he gets away from the bear, he starts to think, oh, I, I've made it, I'm okay. And a lion jumps out and a lion attacks him and he barely gets away with his life. And then robbers and, and wild dogs and all these things. And finally he gets home. And he sees the door to his home and he thinks, I'm safe, I made it home. And he puts his hand to the door and in that moment, a viper jumps out and tags him and kills him. And here's what he's saying. That's what the day of the Lord is like. 
all throughout our life, we have these moments where we escape trial or we escape death or we escape punishment and we go from, from this to this to this and we think we finally made it, that we're gonna skate, that God's never gonna get us. And in that last moment, the day of judgment comes and boom, there's God. It says it comes like a thief. And people hear that and think, oh, why is God being sneaky? God's not being sneaky. God has warned and promised and warned and promised. But the problem is the people that we're dealing with have been preoccupied with themselves and said, well, judgment hasn't happened in my life and it didn't happen in my parents' lifetime. And so I'm okay and you're okay and everybody's okay. And so we believe and fall asleep that God's never gonna come. Same thing happened with Noah. 120 years, Noah preached the gospel and people said, it's not raining today. If it ain't raining today, it's never gonna rain. And then one day it rained. Here's the funny thing. What he's saying is this, is there's gonna come a day when judgment comes and falls on people and they're gonna be mad. And they're gonna be upset and they're gonna say, why God, why? Now there's a old preacher story that I wanna share. And now this is the opposite of what I'm about to tell you, but I want you to hear this and see if you understand the illustration. Preacher story goes like this. There was a man who lived in a house and there was a massive flood that was coming. Lots of rain was happening and the dam was gonna break. And so he's at his house and he's sitting on the front porch and a car comes by and they're like, hey, we're evacuating. Why don't you get in the car with us and leave? And the guy says, no, no, I'm totally fine. I'm gonna sit right here. God's gonna, God's gonna save me. Well, the water starts to rise and now it's waist deep and he's not sitting on the porch anymore. He's kind of you know, up, up a little bit and a boat comes by and the boat comes by and they're like, get in get in. We're, we're getting out of here. It's, it's getting bad. The dam's going to break. And the guy says, nope, nope, nope. God's going to save me. Water keeps rising. Now he's sitting on the roof of the house, surrounded by water. And a helicopter flies over and the helicopter says, this is it. This is the last evacuation. Come with us. And he says, no, God's going to save me. And the helicopter flew away and he drowned. And he went to heaven and he stood before God and he said, God, I thought you loved me. God, I, I, I thought you were gonna save me. And God's like, I sent you a car, a boat and a helicopter. What else did you want? Same thing. These people are gonna say, why God? Why? And God's gonna say, I sent you prophets. I sent you apostles. I sent you the Messiah. I sent you the word. I sent you churches. What else did you want? Now, he asked a question, what kind of people should we be? Because this is gonna happen, what kind of people should we be? Before we ask that question, here's what Peter is saying. Does the fact that the world is gonna end and people are gonna die, and if they don't know Jesus, they're gonna split hell wide open and they're gonna live in eternity separate from God. Does that bother you at all? Do you care? I think the problem for most people is no, we don't. We have busied ourselves with so many other things to hide the fact that we're doing nothing. I'm too busy to be bothered by whether somebody's going to heaven or hell. I mean, I got football games to go to. I got to go to the lake. I got so many more important matters on my heart and mind. I'm just too busy. It 
See, if we really believed what we say that we believe, here's what should happen. There's gonna come a day when Jesus is gonna split the sky wide open and we're gonna see him face to face. And in that moment, millions upon millions upon millions of people are going to die and go to hell. But we need to hurry up and get done so we can go home for lunch. You know, it's crazy. People love in the church when we talk about hell. I don't understand that. I don't understand. When people come up to me afterwards and say, oh, you, you talked about hell today. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah, do you believe that? Because if you do, it should break your heart. It should soften your heart because there are people that you love and that you know that don't know Jesus. And then if you don't say anything to them, they're gonna spend an eternity in hell. But what do you care? We talked about hell today. Verse 11. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? What kind of person should you be? I don't have a chart, don't want one, of when the end's gonna come, but I do know this, it's coming. And every day we wake up, we're one day closer. Every hour that we spend, we're one hour closer. And so here's what he's saying, what kind of person should you be? What that means is what should be important in your life? What should be your priority? What should be what you're looking for? What should be your mission? Well, here's the first thing he tells us, that we ought to be people of holy conduct and godliness. And here's what he means by that. That we're not just doing good things, but God things. We have totally misinterpreted Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and they glorify your father, which is in heaven. And so here's what we say. Let me just do good stuff. Let me be a nice person. That's not what he's talking about. See, we, we, we drag this out of the context of that passage. And so we have to ask some questions. Where does your light come from? Your light comes when Jesus says that he's gonna put his light in you. He's gonna make you a city on a hill. And, and the, this light is not to be covered, it's not to be hidden. And the way that we shine our light is to do God things, not good things. Because here's the problem. We can busy ourselves with good things and not be doing God things. You know, it's crazy. The church has done a really good job of doing a lot of good things. And so people fill up their lives with Bible study they fill up their lives with service projects. They do all these things and not once do they share the gospel. Not once do they apply the words of Jesus to live the gospel, but we're doing good stuff. Hmm. I seem to remember in Matthew chapter seven where people said, hey, we're doing a lot of good stuff and Jesus says, depart from me, I don't know you. Listen, Peter doesn't want his people to miss this and I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to miss God's work in your life. I don't want you to miss the kind of person that God wants you to be. I don't want you to miss out on the mission that God has called you to. What kind of person should I be? Verse 12, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. It's very easy for Christians to complain about this world, to complain about all the things that are happening. 
We say, oh, I wish Jesus would come back quickly. In fact, that's what the word Maranatha means. If you've ever seen that word, it means come quickly, Lord. Do you know that you can help the end come quickly? Did you know that you can speed up the coming of Jesus? Did you know that? How do you do that? Well, you do your part to reach those far from God. Looking for and hastening the coming of the Lord. It means that because we understand that judgment is coming, because we understand that the end of the world is coming and it's changed who we are and it's changed our perspective. And so now we recognize that people are in danger and we need to go to the people in danger and say, hey, look, I need to tell you about Jesus and I need to tell you that he loves you and I need to tell you that he wants to forgive you and he doesn't want to hold your sin against you. I want to tell you that he wants to set you free and give you a new life so that you can be with him forever because he did that for me. It's hilarious that we sit in our churches and in our communities and we complain about all the things that happen and we have the answer and we don't use it. Here's a question. Are you helping? Are you helping? The numbers that I'm about to read to you, I wish were not what they are, but they are. This comes from a study from Lifeway, Southern Baptist organization and they interviewed Christians and they asked them some questions and this was a response. Question, do you pray for lost people? 20% of Southern Baptists who claim to follow Jesus, who claim to have the heart of Jesus, 20% of them rarely or never pray for lost people. Too busy. 48% Southern Baptists. That's almost half of this room. 48% of Southern Baptists have not invited people to church, not one time in the last six months. I'm doing good things. of Southern Baptists have not shared their faith in the last six months. The reality that we have to face is this. There's a day that's coming when governments will fall and nations will be done away with and the size of your house won't matter. How much money you have in your bank account won't help you. There's a day when people are gonna stand before Jesus and here's the reality. Do we care? Do we care that they're gonna stand there and they're gonna blow eternity wide open in a place of separation from God forever? I don't know, that's the question you have to ask. Are you helping? What kind of people should we be? We should be found in peace. Verse 14, be diligent to be found by him in peace. It's a sad reality that this is not the truth for many of us in the church. Romans 12, 18 tells us, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. Notice it didn't say, as far as it depends on them. As long as they're loving, as long as they're kind, as long as they treat you well, 
No, it says, as far as it depends on you. And here's the thing. It is our choice to live at peace with other people. And I seem to remember, I seem to remember somebody important somewhere saying, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called the children of God. Be at peace. Be found spotless and blameless. Now, this doesn't mean perfect. What it means is that we have a relationship with God where when things come into our life that threaten our fellowship, that threaten our relationship, that threaten our service and our witness, that we come to him, we run to him as fast as we can, we confess, we repent, and we allow him to move in our life. That's what that means. We keep a very short account with God. I heard something really crazy this week. I was watching a video where a pastor who had had a massive moral failing and lost his ministry, lost all sorts of these things. He was talking about that. And the person asked a really great question. They said, how could you, doing what you did and knowing what you know, stand up in the pulpit every week and preach? How could you do that? Listen to what he said. Well, the first time that I did what I did, I told a lie and I didn't get caught. And so I just learned to live with it. And I kept lying and I kept covering and I kept hiding and it just got easier and easier and easier. Oh, I believed everything that I preached. I just didn't apply it to my life. And here's the sad reality that many of us as Christians face. We are sidelined because we have bought the lie that, that whatever we've done in our life, now we gotta cover it up and nobody can know about it and we can't deal with it. No, here's what the Bible says. First John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Maybe this is a secret, maybe it's not. This church is full of sinners. Hmm, I thought that I got an amen, but guess not. Amen. It's full of sinners who need God's grace. And the only way to freedom is to confess that you're a sinner and repent of your sin and let him set you free. What I wish that pastor would have said was, you know, it just broke my heart. It ate me up from the inside and I had, I had to get on my face before God, but he didn't. Because here's why, here's what he said. I had to protect my job. Nothing in your life is more important than a healthy relationship with Jesus. We are people who rejoice in God's patience. Verse 15, we regard the patience of the Lord as salvation. Instead of complaining about this world, we should be thankful that God is patient and he's offering people an opportunity to repent. And we should take that opportunity and go to everybody and say, God is giving you time. We should rejoice with every day that we get that it's another opportunity for us to go and share the gospel and live the gospel. Now, I love that Peter follows this up with this. Don't distort the message of the Bible. Because he says, hey, Paul has written about the same things. He's telling you the same stuff. And yet people take that and they twist it because they don't really understand everything that Paul says. And listen, there are times I read Paul and I'm like, what are you talking about? But here's what they say. Don't let them twist the scripture. And here's what happens. It happens every time when it comes to the end of the world. There are people who love to take the end of the world and turn it into fear. We should fear everyone and we should fear everything and we should act out of fear and everything has to be fear. And here's the thing, Peter says, no, it's hope. We don't live in fear. We don't serve in fear because our God has already won. He's already won. Jesus is sitting on his throne and his enemies are under his feet. He's just gonna come and crush them one day. There's no fear, there's hope. He says that we are to be people who grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. He started with this 
And he ends with this. And I'm appreciative of this. Here's what he says. The more you know Jesus, the more gracious, the more kind, the more loving, the more like Jesus you become. In fact, what we should expect to happen would be the longer that you're a Christian, the more gracious and kind and loving that you are. But the problem is that's not the truth. It is an unfortunate reality that many folks in the church, the older they get, the more hateful they get. And the more judgmental they get and the more legalistic that they get. Because here's the deal. Spiritual maturity has nothing to do with the passing of years. Oswald Chambers said this, spiritual maturity has nothing to do with the passing of years. I, I came to faith at 18, I'm 49. I've been a Christian for 31 years. I don't have 31 years of spiritual growth. So you don't get spiritual maturity every time you get a birthday. Here's what he says. Spiritual maturity is not gotten by the passing of years. It only comes by obedience to the will of God. And let me, let me make it really simple. Spiritual maturity only comes when you say yes to Jesus and you apply what Jesus says in your life. That's where spiritual maturity comes from. And here's the problem. We've got people who have been Christians for 115 years and they're a six month old baby. What this means is that we have to think about how Jesus would want us to act in situations. I'm gonna date myself right now. In the 80s and 90s, there was a very popular trend. People wore t-shirts and bracelets with WWJD on them. Remember that, some of you? Do you know what it means? What would Jesus do? And I came to find out that if I saw somebody with a WWJD t-shirt or bracelet on, they were not gonna be doing what Jesus was doing. And they were not gonna be acting how Jesus was acting. Growing in grace, growing in the knowledge of Jesus means that when we approach someone or someone approaches us, the question that we start asking is this. Jesus, how would you treat this person? Jesus, what would you say to this person? Better yet, Jesus, if you were standing here right now, what would you want me to do? And here's a little clue. Jesus isn't just standing here, he's living inside of you. If you love him and follow him. The world is coming to an end. What kind of person do you wanna be? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to hear your word. We thank you for this gift to be able to receive your patience and your mercy. I pray that we grab hold of it and say yes to you. Help us to be the kind of people that you want us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.